Okay, woo, video number nine. This is gonna be uh, the fourth one in the uh, sound design um, series, uh, mini series as part of the overall Ableton starter course that we're doing. Uh, let me just double check this is on, all right. Um, <clears throat> this is gonna be all about resampling, um, as I'm sure at this point it says in the title of the video on YouTube. So. Um, this is gonna be a fun one. This is gonna complete this little like four part mini series inside the Ableton starter course to kind of get you up to speed um, before I start moving on to more uh, fun and specific things after these 10 videos. Um, I'm gonna do one more uh, video 10, which is gonna be on um, basic like beat making and, and groove creation. Um, but this one is all gonna be about resampling. So um, in this, we're gonna cover, uh, well, First off, we're gonna cover how to make some stuff that sounds kind of like this. And maybe something like this. Shoot, do a couple things here. Um, and got another one lined up here, I think, too. So, um, what is resampling and why do we like it in experimental bass music? Uh, well, resampling, um, I guess technically kind of just refers to um, sort of the process when you uh, make any sort of sound in a synth, um, put a bunch of automations into that sound, so there's a bunch of movement, um, and then you freeze and flatten that, bounce it to audio. Um, and then technically resampling would still uh, count if you just took the actual audio clip and chopped it up and reversed it and uh, stretched it out, did all kinds of stuff with it in your arrangement. Um, and I do plenty of that as well. Um, but in this case, we're talking about resampling as in <clears throat> taking that bounce uh, audio and then turning it back into MIDI by way of Ableton's sampler. Um, and if you have simpler, um, you're still gonna be able to do some of this. Uh, Sampler is obviously not quite as robust, so um, this is definitely gonna focus mostly on sampler. Um, but uh, but yeah, you should definitely get sampler anyway if you don't have it, um, it is, it's well worth it. So um, yeah, let's, let's jump right in. Uh, <clears throat> so starting off, um, I have a sampler here and I have this all, all pre-programmed and we're gonna basically recreate this from scratch. Um, the actual sample that I have in here Let's see if the filter is up and all of the, uh, let's see, LFOs and uh, rate and everything is down. It sounds like this. So you can see, I mean, it's it's one tone all the way through. Um, and you can kind of see how the wave sort of dances around, plays with itself a little bit. Um, Yep, I did hear that as it came out of my mouth. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, it like you know, it moves around, it folds back in on itself, um, and uh, things happen in it. So um, to start off with this process, we need a um, harmonically rich and complex waveform that has movement built into it. So um, we're gonna start off with an operator patch. Um, and honestly, I don't even know if I'll do this in uh, racks or just like a single operator. Um, let's see, real quick, let's get a uh, sub going. I'm gonna draw in some harmonics. All right, perfect. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna put my routing onto, I guess something like um, this. Let's, uh, actually, you know what? I am gonna make a rack, cause why not? Um, group this up. Uh, make a new operator in here. I'm gonna try and go through this pretty quick since this is stuff that we've already um, covered. Uh, and you could definitely refer back to the last video or the one right before that on, um, the last video was about racks and the one before that was just about uh, using post-processing on operator patches to get cool sounds. So 
I'm gonna take this and uh, cut out the lows here. Uh, put this as like a saw wave. Ooh, let's see. And let's see, is this on glide? Yep. And I'm actually gonna take this and do something like this. So we have a couple of uh, things to sort of mess around with here. this guy down a little bit. I don't really want that so um, crazy, just like a little bit. So, okay, cool. Um, so, yeah, and then let's actually just do one more uh, operator for get some more of these like kind of high frequencies built in a little bit too. bit so they kind of come in a little bit slower so um what we're essentially going to be creating here is like a you know somewhere between like 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 probably like around a 10 second clip here actually just put in the clip right there um i like to make it usually in d sharp or e just because those are the lowest uh two keys i usually write in um and uh it's easier to pitch stuff up and have it sound good than it is to pitch stuff down when warping is involved. So I like to give myself that option. Um, but in reality, you can just put this at whatever, you know, is whatever you're comfortable with or whatever is like a key that you often write uh, music in. So now we have what sounds like I'm gonna solo this. Uh, okay. Maybe pull this out and maybe make this kind of That's kind of cool. Um, and one of the benefits of having like a 10 plus second long clip here is that we can um, kind of use these longer decay times that normally uh, wouldn't really do much if you're, you know, there's not normally a place to use like a seven, almost eight second decay time in a synth. Um, but with this, there, it's a great opportunity too, since uh, we are just gonna be freezing and flattening this down ultimately. All right, um, that's worth something. Let's, uh, I'm gonna do a little white noise uh, thing too, actually. So on the second operator, or sorry, second oscillator and operator, put it on a white noise. Go back to this one and uh, pitch this down, I don't know, like 20. Like real low. And then trans transpose this down to, uh, to taste. I'm gonna put a little bit of spread on it, but I'm not really concerned um, at this stage, at least uh, with this sound, putting um, too much stereo spread on it because we're going to end up sort of uh, building that in and automating it a little bit um, when we get into some of this processing here. So that's pretty good. Um, I might throw uh, like some OTT on this to kind of... Brighten that up. And let me also cut out the lows on this guy. saturate um, this uh, saw wave a little bit too. Maybe with like a 
like a wave shaper, get some more interesting stuff going on. And I might actually bring this saw down over a period of time. in this guy too now nah, we'll leave it we'll leave the lfos and stuff because um we're gonna be doing a lot of that in sampler so not that you can't get crazy with it and do it in both places um but for this demonstration i want to kind of keep it uh simple and to the point so all right so we got a nice little uh harmonically complex waveform there's some stuff going on uh now it's time to put in some movement let's uh, and by the way just so we can kind of like uh visualize this let me actually just duplicate this out and freeze Oop. Um, oh, and let me go ahead and turn that off. Let's see. All right, cool. She does add a good bit of volume, so let me do it this way. All right, calibration off. All right, perfect. So, uh, flatten this guy. And all right, so this is what we're looking at. Just kind of give you uh, an idea of like our starting point. So you can kind of see. Um, some of these FM stuff going on. Uh, you see the underlying sub that's nice and thick because it kind of overall looks like a jagged uh, saw, uh, sine wave a little bit. So yeah, this is what we got going on. Um, it is harmonically complex. However, there's no movement. Um, what I mean by that is this stretch of wave cycle uh, looks exactly like that wave cycle right there. looks exactly like this one looks exactly like that one and so on and so forth so um that's where we're starting from just to kind of give you like a visual representation of that uh and we'll go back to our midi um and uh keep working on this a little bit so let's um <clears throat> i'm gonna pull in a two band uh split i'm gonna use my eq8 one just since i'm trying to keep this all still mostly or as much as possible in the um the ableton ecosystem and i'm actually going to this white noise and make it a little bit quicker and a little bit quieter all right let me just get rid of this for uh, simplicity's sake okay cool um let's uh throw some saturator on it beef it up a little bit and now let's uh get into the fun stuff um on this uh two band splitter and let me actually just uh rename these for posterity's sake okay um so on this high band let's see let's throw some overdrive on it get some more grit and distortion to it dry wet a little bit and let's grab a max lfo max for live lfo and assign that to this um frequency here uh, uh, uh offset it a little bit pull the depth down so that it basically is covering that range there let's go a little more depth and let's pull the rate down a little bit so it's more like all right cool and then let's um you know what actually i'm not going to use this uh, lfo on this overdrive i'm going to just kind of find a place that i like it good and then um for some of this initial movement let's do it this way this is something that i haven't done in these tutorials yet um and that i use quite a bit to just kind of um get that sort of like neuro sort of squelchy uh movement sound i'm um, just taking eq8 
and drag one of these guys up and drag one of these guys down. Actually, you know what? Um, for the purposes of this, let's do it in two separate ones. Um, sometimes I do it on the same. Sometimes I do it in two separate ones. Uh, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. Um, what is important, though, is that this is on the top band, of course, because um, in case this this notch or this peak sort of dip below 100 hertz, we really don't want it affecting the sub. We want the sub to be nice and thick and consistent the whole time um, so that we can modulate it to our heart's desire later and not have to worry about those things. So let's grab uh, same thing though, an LFO max for live, um, just to give it like a little LFO stuff. And let's map this to this frequency. Um, let's put the offset kind of there and the depth, let's pull the offset back a little bit. And sometimes I leave the rate up just to kind of, um, see quicker, like what the sort of defined, um, path that it's going to take is. Uh, and then I'll pull it back down toward the end because uh, right now it's going to sound crazy if I leave it like this. Like, you know, it's a little, little fast uh, for our liking. <laughs> so, and I might actually bring the Q, let's see, down a little bit too. Offset there. All right, cool. Let's try this. And maybe pull the gain down a little bit actually too. Yeah, so it's not so aggressive. It's just this kind of like sweeping um, sort of thing that's happening with it, right? So, all right. And if this sounds like shit so far, you know, just bear with me here. Um, <laughs> we're we're going to get there. So, all right. Let's grab another one of these LFO uh, Max for Live devices. Map this to uh, this sort of notch cutouts frequency as well and kind of do a similar thing. Um, something that's crucial for this, though, is you don't want these rates at the same. I mean, maybe you do, but, like, that's not what we're going for. To make it sound more alive, you want them to sort of, like, fold and uh, sort of, uh, like, run around themselves, like, run run through each other, not just sort of, like, be on the exact same path the entire way through. Then it starts to sound a little bit more mechanical, which, you know, if that's what you want, then definitely do keep them the same. Um, so let me pull this depth down a little bit and offset it. Let's see. So, um, and in the same sort of vein, you also don't really want it as like a double. Like if this is 0.09, I don't necessarily want this one at like 0.18 because then it's still going to be on the same path. It'll just uh, repeat two cycles um, for every one that uh, the other one does. So, all right, that's uh, something so far. Let's um, let's grab a frequency shifter and uh, do some stuff here. Uh, with this. And actually, before we do, um, let's program in some movement by taking this overdrive and actually just um, automating the frequency a little bit. So. up a little bit and actually I'm just gonna um, right click here and hit add lane for each automated envelope maybe let's increase the distortion right there there we go something like that Um, there, so this effect is a little more filtery and a little less uh, distorty. <laughs> and 
let's just program in like a little kind of back and forth thing here. A lot of this is like you know it's going to be hard to control because we have a bunch of um programmed movement in so it's going to be lining up different places and a lot of times that's just how you get some of the coolest sounds so um we're going to keep rocking with it for a little while and just keep uh, sort of sculpting for a second And here's something else. Um, this white noise is starting to kind of bother me a little bit. So what I'm actually just going to do is um, automate it. <clears throat> Let's just take the chain volume here and just kind of play with that a little bit. I don't really want it much uh, louder than that, but I do want it a little bit lower at point. So... <laughs> We're getting there. We're getting there. Um, all right. Let's take uh, before we uh, hit this shifter. Let's actually do um, a little multiband dynamics, a little multiband compression to uh, bring up that top end a little bit. So. I'll do a whole video on just multiband dynamics at some point soon. Um, you know, if you don't know much about it right now, don't even bother with the compression piece of it and just basically use it as like a three band um, EQ. Uh, essentially, you can just turn up the input gain, the output gain of it. Um, to let you know, when you uh, grab one of these and drag down, it um, puts a, a normal compression ratio on it. And when you grab one of them and drag up, it'll turn blue and it'll um, put a, an expansion uh, ratio on it. So then you have a threshold, which is where these points are, and you have um, the below the threshold, which uh, right now it's at a 1 to 1.12. That means expansion um, versus, uh, or sorry, that's actually this guy here. Yep. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, as opposed to like a, like a, like a 4 to 1 ratio. Um, or something like that. This is using a one, two, 
something else uh, ratio. So, uh, and then you have the above as well, which is, you know, there. So, um, okay, let's go back to uh, pull, push and pull. And, and uh, you know, if all else fails until that video comes along, um, you know, watch uh, a different video on Ableton multiband dynamics or just multiband compression in general. Um, and, uh, you know, just kind of play around, poke at it a little bit. going to take a glue compressor and um, I guess a limiter as well on the other side of this and I'm gonna I'm gonna soft clip this Uh, the limiters just kind of control the volume and compress a little bit more. Um, this glue compressor, I'm not really using the threshold that much. I mean, I guess I need to it, but, um, I'm mostly using it for the makeup gain and the soft clipping aspect. Um, this is just going to kind of bring some of these automations out a little bit. Um, and now let's get into the uh, the shifter and do some fun stuff with this. So I like to put this on uh, frequency mode. Um, pitch mode is actually new as of Ableton 11. So if you're in Ableton 10 or before, you might not even have this pitch mode. You might just have frequency and ring. Um, let's put this like around 50%. It doesn't even be exactly, but you know, whatever. And if you start to automate this fine tuning, you get stuff like this. Let's pull that out a little bit. as well it'll basically do the same thing the farther away from zero um, you get some really cool like uh, phasing um, scenarios that happen <laughs> Let's grab a uh, filter, or um, I like to use EQ8s a lot as filters. Throw this over here, and throw something like this in. And honestly, for this, I might just hit, um, uh, make sure that you have this uh, button right here um, highlighted. This is the automation arm. You can see over in the, the corner here. Um, Automation arm. So when this is enabled and you uh, and you hit the record button, as you automate certain parameters, um, it'll it'll record that automation as well. So make sure that is in here. And uh, then let's see. Let's just go ahead and hit this, and I'm going to start to just kind of move this around. Um, I'm not going to go too far because I don't really want anything that's like like that. Um, I'm mostly going to play around up here. Um, just to kind of give it uh, some movement rather than like actually cutting out frequencies. So um, yeah, we can kind of keep this. Actually, I'm gonna put this on oversampling as well, just because why not? So all right, uh, let's go ahead and do that. Oh, and you also should hit this plus button. <laughs> I forgot about that. All right, cool. <laughs> All right, cool. 
So um, something that is uh, nice to do, I don't know if we're really going to need it in this case, um, but what happens is it logs all these little points all through there. If you um, highlight that entire section and just right click on them, you can click on simplify envelope and it'll make them much, uh, uh, it'll basically just reduce the total number of points so it's a little bit easier to edit. I think you can continue doing this to a point. Uh, nope. Yeah, once it does it once, I guess it'll basically sit there. So. Right. Oh, this, uh, whoop, that's the resonance. So let's pull out. Um, here we go. Is the uh, actual frequency. We do the same thing there. Simplify envelope. And let me actually put this next to the resonance. Um, let's see. So, and then with this, we can go in and um, just kind of cut some uh, fun little like stuff like this. Like. this uh where is our um and if you ever kind of lose track of like which uh envelopes you're automating over here you can always just click on the parameter um click on it and don't drag up or down because it'll turn gray and you'll have to click on this re-enable automation um if you're ever worried about that you can also right click and click show automation and it'll automatically pull it up in this uh, top section right here so uh with this one i kind of want to just uh tweak this this white noise a little more so um you'll notice that throughout this whole process as you kind of go deeper into um the post-processing and adding all this movement into this sample or this midi clip uh realistically um, you're going to notice that, you know, certain things sort of become exaggerated or muted or um, one or the other, and you're going to need to kind of tweak as you uh, as you kind of go through to your taste. So, so let's... that moving on uh, all right let's see um, where do we want to go from here let's throw another uh, OTT in here and just kind of bump up the highs and maybe do some actual EQing uh, on this whole sort of top band here Maybe uh, I'll, I might actually just take this this uh, frequency of this four and just kind of move it around to like any problem areas. Actually, you know what? Let's uh, let's hold off on this for right now. Let's do this. Um, let's freeze this as is. I'm gonna duplicate this and flatten it. So I have my other one there if I want to go back and further tweak stuff on that MIDI clip. Um, but for the time being, we can sort of work off of this clip and now we can kind of address those problem areas um, a little bit easier since we won't have uh, all the movement that we programmed in is now officially programmed in. Like it's not moving like those LFOs aren't just constantly going um, and constantly changing every time we play it back through. Now they're printed into the audio. So if there is a, a problem area, I can go in with an EQ and just sort of... Um, tweak it right then and there so um, and this is all sort of part of the process like sometimes I'll go through this like eight separate times um, with the audio and I'll like reverse clips and I'll um, sort of warp certain things uh, et cetera, et cetera. so we'll go through this now and see what we got here <laughs> So like right around here, we kind of, there's like some sharp uh, white, white noise there. So, so I might just, uh, by the way, double clicking on these parameters here, we'll just return them to default. So a lot of times I'll sort of like 
move this around to kind of figure out where my problem is. Like that, very problematic. It sounds good with a dip to like about 10. So I'll just double click on that to return it to the neutral point of uh, the default. And then I can go in here and uh, pull it back down to where it kind of sounded good, like right around like nine or 10. You'll notice that a lot of times when I go to uh, cut little points and always put a farther point over here just so that there's always a piece of it at the end that stays at zero. Honestly, if you're gonna go through an edit, you may as well just put one in right there, so. All right, and let's saturate this a little bit. And I'm not gonna, you know, reprint this multiple times. I'm just gonna kind of go through and, um, and do a do a sort of quicker version. Um, sometimes it's like there's really no limit to how long you can spend on this part of the process, just to get these waveforms. Um, like for all the ones in my um, like sample pack and uh, future sample packs that aren't even released yet, um, like all of these. It's like, you know, I spent quite a bit of time making sure everything's like leveled and EQ'd right and saturated and the movement is sort of where I want it. Um, but then you can get a lot of use out of them. Um, a lot of these I've used several times in different projects. So, um, all right. This area over here, just in general. Let's see. Just kind of give that top end a little bit more. Uh... All right, and let's uh, compress the whole thing a little bit. This So dip this uh, just a tiny bit. So dip the actual kind of sub uh, frequency here. And you'll notice, by the way, um, when you're using the soft clipper aspect of this glue compressor, um, just wait till you sort of see the light come on. You'll know, like here, it's not really clipping, just because uh, even though I have this this highlighted, it's not actually doing any clipping. So you can kind of see like that point right there is sort of when this light starts lighting up, and you'll do it as red without that. You can kind of see like when it's starting to hit that peak. Um, so. I'm gonna go a little bit past that peak for for just the purposes of this because why not? All right, that sounds good. Um, let's duplicate this out. And, uh, and, and, you know, if, if you do this and there's certain parts of this that still sound harsh, just flatten it again um, and then go through with another EQ and just sort of automate in little um, EQ bits. And if it's easier to do it in real time, you can uh, make sure that the plus and the automation arm are highlighted. Click on record and just drag a peak and sort of um, do it to ear where it sounds good. Or visually look in here and kind of see where some of these are and just EQ them out um, or, uh, you know, filter them or whatever you want to sort of uh, tame some of those kind of harsher frequencies. So let's freeze and flatten this. And you'll see that um, because I am soft clipping it a decent bit, uh, all the pieces here that sort of don't quite touch the top or maybe get like pretty close to touching the, um, like the, the clipping point, the, the theoretical zero dB mark on here, um, it's now going to become a lot straighter across the top. So I'm going to flatten that. All right. And by a lot straighter, I mean like pretty much entirely straight. <laughs> uh, that's what happens when you when you uh, clip the uh, clip it and then use the soft clipper in glue compressor. Um, the saturator uh, soft clipper, by the way, uh, works similarly. In case you weren't aware, there's a soft clip option here. Um, one thing I like about the glue compressor one is it has that little um, LED simulator thing that kind of shows you as it's approaching that clip point. So um, here we go. We have a nice little sample here. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
all right got a lot of grit to it um you can see that there's still like a nice kind of like square-ish uh sine wave underneath that's still propelling that low end um and i'll pull in like a spectrum analyzer as well just so you can kind of see that by the way if your uh, spectrum analyzer does not look like this it's probably because uh this is on uh, auto on the ground so make sure that that's on range and then you can kind of just drag that all the way up and drag this all the way down or you can drag this not all the way down and kind of get a different view so just play around with that um, all right that's nice lots of movement pretty much everywhere except for right here which is good um, because we kind of want like a nice underlying uh subtone so now that we have that and i'm actually going to bring this clip edge to the to the very uh, edge of the actual audio piece right there and hit command J on a PC that'd be control J um, you can also right click and hit consolidate and if you ever forget the shortcut as always it'll tell you the shortcut right there um, so what consolidating it does uh, if you watch the other um, earlier videos in the series about uh, just uh, using sample clips in general um, now you can't there that little tail isn't there this clip essentially literally goes from the very beginning of the audio to the very end of the audio and that's good it's just going to make our lives a little bit easier um, when we get into the sampler part of this so let's uh, do shift command t or shift control t in other words um, insert a midi track let's grab uh, a sampler throw that in here and uh, perfect all right we're going to drag this new sample that we've created into here whatever note um, you made this in like in my case I made it in uh, D sharp so um, if we go in here the first thing you should do is take the root and uh, hit your whatever D sharp note pull this down let's also solo this All right, cool. We got that there. A um, couple things you'll notice. It's it's really uh, quiet and it's really dim. Uh, it's like dulled on the top. So uh, first thing, if you go into filter global, by default, they have the volume at negative 12 on the sampler. So let's just put that at zero. Um, let's, while we're here, put the voices at one. And over here in the filter, um, if you watch the last couple of videos, you'll know that the key tracking can be problematic. So let's put the key uh, tracking down to zero as well. And now in different versions of live, if you're in 10 or if you're in 11, um, I don't remember which of these uh, parameters I've changed, you can reset your default. So um, yours may look a little bit different the first time you open these up or kind of go in there. But yeah, just make sure the key tracking here, um, down here is, uh, is on zero and uh, voices are at one, volume's at zero. And then it should sound pretty much the same as that. Um, all right, let's go back to uh, soloing this guy. And all right, so let's start, um, you know, now we have that waveform, that kind of crazy, complex, uh, harmonically rich waveform with a lot of movement built into it in our sampler. And, uh, ooh, yeah, look at that, that's nice. All right, cool. Um, so let's start building out this uh, this rack so you can kind of see um, how to add in a lot of the macros and a lot of the control that I had in that. Um, let's first go ahead and group it. And um, this part will be, if you watch the very end of the last video, I kind of teased this part. So um, here's what we're gonna do. We're going to open up these macros. Let's go to modulation, turn on the auxiliary modulation, go to A, Put this to sample offset and then make sure and turn the effect value up to 100 um, or the the amount up to 100 then let's take the peak and map that to macro one let's go back to the sample this is kind of important too um, as of right now if it's at 100 percent, that means it's going to start uh, basically what's what's happening here is <clears throat> this peak we've now assigned where the peak is um to be the sample playhead so if this is at zero percent and we press a key you can kind of see that um the the orange in there it's a little bit hard to see but it starts playing from the very beginning of the clip as we pull this uh this up you'll see that it now is playing from kind of like right here and as we pull it up a little more so the problem uh, with this is if you ever go to 
nothing will really play at all because it's playing from the very end of the clip. So uh, let's put this back to zero for right now. Let's um, go ahead and put sustain mode. Let's do the, the back and forth arrows, meaning it's gonna get to the end and start going in reverse. Um, now what this means is if you play it almost to the very end, it'll hit the end and go. Um, now I don't know if you heard it uh, on your listening device, but there's like a little pop in there as it sort of switches direction. Um, so to fix that, let's, uh, oh, the crossfade, uh, we can't do anything with until you take this loop marker and <clears throat> pull that up. So it's unfortunately a little bit hard to see. Um, you know what I might do just for uh, <laughs> the purposes of this? Let's take this and like just turn this down a little bit. It'll be a lot easier to see when um, the whole thing isn't like covered in yellow. So let's uh, consolidate that. And let's re-put this in. Oh, did it do the same thing? Well, that's okay. Let's see. All right, yeah, it doesn't really uh, matter or make much of a difference as it turns out, so. All right, so, um, yeah, just pull this this top uh, piece, like this right here is your actual play marker, right? This top piece here is what defines uh, the loop. If you look really close, you can kind of see how there's like this bar right there. So that is going to be our loop. For instance, if I put this right toward the beginning, put this back at zero, yeah, and do it this way, put a little crossfade in. <laughs> It's just going to bounce around that loop. Now, the reason it goes a little bit outside of the loop is because I have this crossfade, which you can't really see, but it makes a nice little um, sort of crossfade on the clip so that it actually pulls it in a little bit before it reaches that point. Um, so let's leave this at the end, pull this in a little bit so that we can actually use this crossfade. And um, cool. So now, even if we play this at the very end, it'll just actually play the entire sample in reverse, which is pretty cool. Um, another way to get some some cool effects there. All right, um, let's go back to Filter Global and uh, start kind of like setting this up so it's nice and controllable. Um, first thing, I don't really want this this uh, super like kind of, well there it doesn't really matter, but like that click right in the beginning, um, as you know from the operator videos or just synths in general, MIDI devices in general. Let's pull that attack out um, just a little bit so it's a little bit smoother. Um, okay, next up, let's start uh, assigning some of these things to macros outside of just the uh, the sample playback position. So let's take the resonance. I'm going to move the resonance up a little bit. It's a little harsh, so maybe like right there. All right, cool. Uh, I'm gonna leave it all the way uh, open, leave the filter all the way open right now, and I'm gonna take the frequency though and map that to macro two. So now we have a filter frequency on our macro. Cool, um, all right, let's leave it open though for now. Um, let's just go ahead and set the filter envelope amount all the way up to its max. Um, with the filter all the way open, it's not really gonna do much. Um, but when we start uh, pulling this back a little bit, if we um, have that all the way up, and now we also actually have to uh, kind of define the envelope. So let's do that also. but um, that's kind of a nice little envelope, you know, why not? Let's... Maybe I'll stay shorter. All right, cool, leave that there. Um, let's see, what do we got? Uh, let's go to pitch oscillator tab. Let's assign this uh, glide to, let's see, where do we wanna put this? Let me check what I did up here. Um, cause I actually moved these around a couple of times in the course of this, uh, right there. So let's 
uh, with the output volume there. Okay, that makes sense. Whatever, let's do it a little bit differently because why not? Let's put the glide time um, <clears throat> right on three. And what I did uh, naming wise is I did this. I did a dash and then a slash P for portamento, and then another slash G for glide, just to remind myself kind of where it was, meaning that um, this is the glide, uh, glide on or off. So if it's at zero, it'll be off. If it's in the middle, it'll be on portamento, um, which for bases isn't really super relevant because portamento gives you sort of like a glide time that's usable um, with chords. So we don't really need that. But uh, the point is here is that you can have it all the way up and glide will be on. Or you can have it all the way off and each uh, time the envelope will restart. Pretty cool. Um, and you notice how like crazy it sounds and sort of like chaotic. And I'm not even doing anything right now because we already have all that programmed in. Um, so that's the cool thing about this whole uh, sort of method. Um, so let's keep going and assigning some of these other things. Um, let's see, what else did I have on here? I had, uh, t -t 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 yeah, a couple of LFOs. Oh, in the course. All right. So, um, here is a big reason to use this. There's something that you can only do, uh, through this resampling method, um, by taking a, a base clip that you made and running it through sampler. This way you can, um, FM any wave that you want. So this whole crazy, complex, harmonically rich, uh, movement filled um, sort of base that we've created. Now we can turn this uh, on the pitch oscillator tab uh, in the sampler, turn on this um, oscillator, leave it at negative infinite for right now, but let's uh, take that and map that to macro. Let's go with macro five actually, and I'll, I'll show you why in a second. Um, all right, and then let's take the course and let's map that to macro six. So now these two macros down here, let's put the course up to um, like seven, I guess, for right now. And as we start playing this through, and you can go higher with the course and get even kind of crazier, gnarly, like kind of met metallic sounds. Pull the peak up. And let's put the glide on too. So, yep, start to get pretty crazy pretty quick, which is always fun. Um, you can also throw on pitch envelopes if you want to, um, and just kind of like, you know, you're not limited to just uh, assigning things to macros and having that be like the only parameter control. You can obviously just automate anything in the sampler you want. So if you want like a, a pitch envelope too, um, you can always do something like that. Like... Um, but for now, I'm going to leave that off. Um, and by the way, as of Ableton 11, you now have up to 16 macros. Um, so I'm going to go oh, back and put that back down to eight. Um, whoops, went a little too far. Um, and 16 would be awesome for this. Um, but just in case people are in Ableton 10 still, um, I'm just going to keep this to eight. You can obviously apply this logic to, um, you know, infinity and just keep going crazy with it. Um, so we have three more of these macros uh, while we're at this sort of eight point. We'll put this up to like, I don't know, nine for now too. Um, and let's go back to this modulation tab. Let's turn on LFO one. Let's put the uh, frequency of this LFO, map that to macro four. Um, this is just like a organizational thing. Um, I have a MIDI controller with eight knobs in two rows laid out exactly like this. So um, it's kind of easier to keep things in sections. So like, you know, obviously the first one is just the sample playback. Um, that's always fun. Um, the second two right here are the filter frequency. Um, and then we have glide time. These two kind of go together and then these three sort of go together. But you can obviously arrange this literally however you want and make sense for your brain. Um, so we have this, this uh, frequency here. Let's leave it. It doesn't really matter where we put it right now. Um, let's grab the volume and map that to macro seven and grab the filter and map that to macro eight. Um, so now, again, if the filter is all the way open, this won't really have much of an effect, but if the filter becomes closed, 
and we turn this on. And now if you want this to override the actual filter envelope that we have, um, just go back in and just turn the filter envelope off. And if you turn the volume LFO at the same time, you'll get really like a proper sort of like wow out of it. Um, and it's going to have that sort of uh, kind of like crisp, uh, sort of like, sort of like metallic-y um, top end just because it's resonant. So you can always turn that down as well. And then you can play with this rate as well. Um, and if you want to, too, you can put the rate on um, beats and uh, just kind of put that wherever you want that here. So like right now, if we, let's see, let me turn all these off, um, leave this on and soloed. So I put in a little beat uh, here just to kind of give us some something uh, rhythmic to kind of measure against. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, that's kind of the, the, the basics of this. Um, uh, you can keep kind of moving this around. Some really cool things that you can do if you really just want to get crazy and program in a ton of randomness. Um, you can take an LFO and throw it in this uh, instrument rack that we've created and map this to the peak, which is the sample start time. So that every time you play a note... <laughs> Let me actually pull both these down and pull this up. I'm just playing one note, um, and every time it's going to play uh, somewhere a little bit different. And you can turn this up. The more you turn this up, uh, the more kind of like random it's going to be. Because it's cycling back and forth just like constantly. Um, so the chances of, you know, you hitting the same one on every beat are, are a lot slimmer versus if you have it real slow, um, like that. It's just kind of, kind of move through. Um, so yeah, I like to have it up kind of fast. You can also, instead of having this on sign, you can put this on random, um, and then it'll be completely random. Put the rate up as much as you want, and it'll just constantly be choosing random values. Cool. Um, yeah, and then really easy to just kind of like play along with stuff if you have that. Um, you can also, uh, if you do have a MIDI controller, just hit uh, Command M or Control M and just map each of these if you want to like throw that on there. Um, that's a there, that's a there, that's a there. That to there, that to there, this to here. Um, and in case you've never MIDI mapped uh, a knob to something, all you need to do is just kind of click on the purple area. That's the parameter that you can um, map. And uh, you'll kind of see these four corners kind of appear near it. And then just touch the, the, the MIDI knob. Um, and it'll automatically assign it. And all those mappings will be in here. You can kind of edit the values um, and things like that, like the minimum maximum for that value as well. So, and then just hit Command M or Control M if you're on a PC uh, after. So now, um, for instance, I have my filter right on this knob, so I can just kind of play something out. Um, let's go to MIDI, by the way. I'm going to put the range up to an octave just so it's more like... Cool. Um, so really simple at this point to kind of... Uh, let's just put in like, um, like a MIDI clip here and find a good... Uh, Let's actually, let's get rid of this alpha just for a second, and let's find a good starting position. Actually, that's kind of fine for now. Find where this is in the piano roll. Pull this out, maybe like uh, something like this. And whoop, whoop, let's uh, 
something like this all right um so go back in here what's cool about this now is we can take uh this peak and just sort of automate it however we want so it's going to start right at zero in the beginning and now as we start to um kind of progress through whatever riff again the whole point of this is just to give yourself a really um basically prepare yourself so that when you actually go to writing the baseline, um, you have all this movement and complexity built into the actual synth um, so that you're not really having to go through and automate, you know, 35 different parameters in the same clip. Let's pull this back down here. Let's go in and do some pitch bending. As you go, um, if something seems off, like there's like a wrong little like whoa, whoa, whoa in the wrong spot with what you're doing, you can just go back and kind of readjust where this is. The whole point of um, me cutting things in here that look like this, for instance, and this right here, um, and this is to have those moments in there if I want them. Um, but you know, at the same time, we also have stuff that's like this, that's like a lot gentler as far as. Um, the movement goes so there's some quick movements and there's some slower movements um, that way when I get to this point um, if if you know you do like a pitch bend and it hits one of those quick movements that doesn't exactly sound right right in there um, you can really easily just find something else that sounds better so like so all right let's do that and then let's um, let's play with this uh, well let's open this up first of all I don't know why that was so, all right, here we go. Pull this out. Let's uh, go in a little bit closer since I know you're going to be on a YouTube screen. Cool. Let's actually just, yeah, leave that kind of. And I don't like that. Um, let's uh, do the same thing where I add lane for each automated envelope. You'll see me doing this quite a bit. Um. All right, cool. And let's take the filter and pull it back down. All right, and then on this one, let's uh, let's play with this um, this uh, FM uh, option that we have here. Whoop. Let's pull this up. So I can... the chord. 
course a little bit. The other nice thing about having the course pitch on this uh, macro is that when you go to change the course, you won't have this crazy grid-like thing. Like for instance, um, if I go to this sampler down here, which we haven't really done much to, uh, and I go to pitch oscillator and I click on course, you'll see, I don't know how much here, let me pull this open. Uh, you'll see that this is all in these discrete values. And because there are um, 48 of them, uh, it's quite a long thing um, to kind of scroll through. So like if you have something down here at one and this isn't all the way open, sometimes uh, it can really uh, be kind of a challenge to sort of like find the point that you're looking for. It involves a lot of scrolling um, or like opening this up. And by the way, on a Mac at least, you can always just hit um, option and scroll and it'll open it for you for a shortcut there. I don't know what it'll be on PC, probably like control or something like that. Um, maybe alt, I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, point being, I don't really love it. So I'm gonna delete that, go back into here. Um, so by having the course pitch assigned to a macro, when I go to edit the course pitch, um, let's see, where were we here? Got kind of, uh, okay, here we go. So when I go to actually edit the course pitch, let me pull back out all these. So I have that third right here. Um, I don't have that crazy grid. It's just uh, the entire span 48 to 0.125 all exists here. And if you need to get more fine detail, I mean, it shouldn't be that crazy to move through them, but you can always just hold shift and it'll slow down um, how quickly you change through your values. So, and that should be the same on a PC or a Mac. So, um, so let's see, we have this here. <laughs> pitch bend to kind of make that sound a little cooler. So, yeah, like I said, um, you know, I don't want to, let's see, what, what are we time-wise? Um, oh, wow, over an hour. Okay, cool. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I usually don't do this in less than an hour um, when I'm actually starting from scratch. However, uh, a lot of my sound design sessions are split up so that I'm not necessarily doing this all in one go um, while I'm, like, in the middle of writing a song. Um, I'll sit and just spend, like, hours sometimes uh, just making these samples and getting them um, really well balanced, like frequency wise, EQing wise, um, get the movement programmed in that I want, have uh, some crazier moments and some calmer moments so that I have a lot of options later. Um, and then I'll just kind of stash them in my user um, uh, library, which by the way, if you don't know how to do that, just click on one of these, um, click on the, uh, I guess in 11, it's right here in 10, it was a little bit kind of bigger, but yeah, just click on where it has the file name. It'll open it up in your um, current project uh, files. You can uh, just click into it. Hit Command R if you want to, or Control R on a PC. Um, rename it to something like um, Tuesday Base or you know Crazy Saw Thing in E, um, and then you can just kind of drag it into your user library and make a folder for them, and kind of keep a nice little collection of these. Um, this one isn't like the prettiest sounding or the uh, cleanest. Um, cause I didn't want to spend three or four hours working on it. Um, but hopefully this kind of gives you some really cool, um, ways to play with stuff. Um, gives you some creative ideas. So 
Uh, you can do this with any kind of sound that you want. If you just want like a really basic like harmonic FM sine wave, you can do that. If you want just like a really simple like saw or square wave, you can do that. Um, I still recommend just putting in a little bit of filter movement, if nothing else, uh, maybe a little bit of like kind of automated distortion here and there, just to give it some minor differences. Um, like as I go through here, you'll notice that some of these, um, like in my newer stuff too, uh, let's see, some of these don't have that much variety, like this. You'll notice that it does kind of evolve and move a little bit, but not quick, not fast. Um, this one does a little bit more. Some of these really do. Some of them have almost none, like this one. Uh, really doesn't have any movement built into it. Um, I just put it in there because you have so many like cool built-in LFO options and FM options and, and filter envelope options all right within a uh, sampler that really once you have um, like a tone for any instrument, it doesn't have to be with basses, um, by the way. You can use this for any sort of synth sound that you want. Um, the reason I specifically like it for basses is because um, having like a ton of movement is really crucial. Um, and so, yeah, it gives you some, uh, some easy ways once you have done all the prep work to like pull in a cool sounding sample and write a whole baseline in it. Um, and you have all your parameters to tweak pretty easily right there. So, um, awesome. Thanks for, uh, sticking this through, sticking this out with me. Um, if you've made it this far in the video and, um, as always, thanks so much for watching, um, like, and subscribe, and, uh, I will keep putting these videos out and hopefully, uh, giving you some new ways to work in Ableton. So cheers.